Um, I'm just there's so many different and um, so many questions to to to, to go through. I I just um, someone had written about I wanted to go to yes. You've touched on this, but it's it's interesting that they mentioned so many different theories. So given the new theories on the origin of life, such as alkali events and evidence on the, abil um, the ability for organic molecules to replicate on the surfaces of crystals, do you think your original theory of primordial soup still holds true and is the best working hypothesis for the origin of life on Earth? I'm, I'm, I don't hold up. A, I don't hold a torch for any particular theory of the origin of life. Um, I'm very interested in um, Ken Smith's ideas of, of, of crystals. I'm very interested in the RNA world theory. I, mean, I don't care. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm fascinated by all these, these ideas. And uh, what, what I care about is that, is that we, we need to have some theory to account for the origin of the first self-replicating entity. Now, if that's an inorganic crystal, great, fine. If that's um, RNA, also great. Um, if it's some, something in, um, hot springs, if it's something in in um, deep sea vents, that's great too. I, I, as I, as I don't care, I do, I do care, I'm very interested, but, I, but it, it's a matter of indifference to me as long as there is some theory of it, which of course there is. Um, when somebody touches on, I was asking you at the beginning about the comfort of religion, and this is a similar, a similar question is, in some regions of the world, people fight for survival on a daily basis. Could it not be, do you not agree that religion makes it easier for them to cope with the daily struggles and they don't have the luxury uh, of scientific discussion, discussion on the meaning of life? Yes, I'm sure that's probably right. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that, that um, it, it, it sort of is a luxury and uh, it doesn't mean it isn't true. Um, and I do care passionately about what's true, but I think it's, could be argued also that if you are living in poverty or slavery, indeed, um, being persuaded that, say, this life is just temporary and you're going to have it all right when you get to heaven, sort of thing, might be might stop you from rebelling against the terrible privations in which you live. I think it's it's arguable that um, the, the slaves in America um, were as it were, kidded into thinking that they didn't need to worry about having a horrible life in th this life because it's all going to get better in, in, the, in, the, in the next life. And in a way, I'd, I'd rather they rebelled. I'd rather they, they, they turned on their captors and, and, and freed them, themselves. And maybe if, if religion tended to soften their resolve to do that, I think it might have been a bad thing. So we know what you don't think happens when you die. A number of people have asked, what do you therefore think happens? And also, uh, do you fear it? Well, what, what happens, um, nothing happens. You, you become, you become um, the, lights, the lights go out. Um, I fear dying. I fear um, not being allowed to go to the vet and, and uh, be put down. Um, because uh, m m most people's deaths are not particularly pleasant, I suspect, and so I think I think that dying is a is is not a pleasant prospect. Um, death itself, um, as I said earlier on, I think that the prospect of living forever is a terrifying uh, one. Um, if 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 I think about what actually might be frightening about death, it would be the idea of eternity, um, and um, that there is something disquieting about about the, the, the world going on and on and on for billions of years without you, but the world going on and on for billions of years with you might be even worse. And so I think that um, the, the prospect of dying under a general anaesthetic appeals to me and the prospect of spending eternity under a general anaesthetic appeals to me as well. And that's what's going to happen. Uh, I'm glad someone's asked this because, as you say, a lot of um, the end of the book or the very uh, the last part of the book is how excited, essentially, we should be about science and, you know, the things that you just wouldn't believe were true, uh, that they are. I can't remember what you say, what you repeatedly say. You can't be serious, John, John McEnroe, about the things that, that science yeah, can do. Kind of the theory, yeah. um, Simon asks, um, what, in your view, is the current most exciting research in evolutionary biology? 
Well, let me think. Well, I suppose the origin of life, which has come up several times, uh, is one of them. I mean, I would dearly, dearly like to see that solved uh, before I go. Um, I would like to see um, something. I'd, li I'd like to understand human consciousness, subjective consciousness, which I think is a huge mystery. It's got to be soluble. I mean, it, it is obviously a product of brains. It's something to do with brain physiology. Uh, and so um, I would like to see that um, solved. And so brain research is, is immensely exciting. Um, the whole of molecular biology, uh, which has become such a vibrant part of science now, ever since the double helix um, was solved in 1953, when we've understood that genetics is all about digital coding. It's like a branch of computer science. It is a branch of computer science. It's just that it's quaternary rather than binary, but otherwise it's just like computers. And so this is something which would have amazed Darwin. I, he did, wouldn't have had the concept of what, what a digital code is, but I think he would have got it in the end. Um, it's, um, it's, it, it's an amazing thing that at, at root, all of life is digital. It's digital coding, it's information. And, and that, that's what's propelling molecular genetics along. And it is an immensely exciting field. So I think that's probably my answer to the question. Um, by the way, there are a number of comments remarking on your shirt and how much people <laughs> would like to know where it's from. Well, it's um, to, to, can you see the, the, the leaves as well of the, of the, of the plant here? I'm, I'm trying to mimic the leaves, trying to camouflage myself with the, with the leaves. Which um, is quite highly appropriate. Um, I, I'm just an interesting question. Someone at the beginning said, does it matter? Does it really matter at all what the meaning of life is? Let's just get on with doing it the best we can, whatever the meaning. Do we analyze these things too much? And that's obviously a stupid question probably to ask someone who analyzes it, but you know well, where to go. It's immensely important to me. I mean, I, I, I think you've got to be somewhat brain dead if you just want to get on with living your life and don't, want to, don't ever want to understand why you exist in the first place. I mean, I, I, I want both. I mean, I, I want to get on with, with my life and I want to go on with having a good life and enjoying myself and hoping to other people enjoy with helping other people have a good life too. But um, the thought of just living your life without having the basic curiosity to wonder where you came from and why you exist and what's it all for, I, I can't imagine that. Richard, you've given us a great deal um, this evening to, to think about, of course, and I'm so grateful to you for doing this. And I'm incredibly grateful to all of you who've tuned in and the questions about that. Oh, actually, you know, you must just ask if you've answered your shirt. There's also pictures about questions about your pictures behind. So just before we sign off, perhaps you could explain as you did to me before we came okay. live. Um, the, 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 the picture up there is uh, it's called the Expectant Valley, it's by Desmond Morris, who is a friend of mine, and it is the picture that was used on the cover of the first edition of The Selfish Gene and of sub some subsequent editions of The Selfish Gene. Um, as it happened, um, that picture was in a sale of Desmond Morris's paintings around the time when The Selfish Gene was being published, and um, the, the price of it was exactly the price of the advance which the publishers had offered me, which was £750. And so that seemed to me like an omen. And so I bought the painting and, and it was used on the, on, on, on the cover. Desmond was rather embarrassed that I bought this picture as a friend of his. So he threw in that one as well, um, which is called the titillator. Uh, and so these two um, go together. They're both by Desmond Morris, who is of course um, a, a, a biological author, a very highly successful biological author and television personality and former curator, director of the London Zoo and so on, director, curator of mammals in the London Zoo. But, um, and an Somebody clever in my computer has actually just pointed out, this is a bonus event. They're normally an hour, but we actually have an extra five minutes. This event um, good. goes yeah. on a little bit longer. So I have time for a few more questions, which is wonderful That's because good. your questions are brilliant. So um, somebody asked, do you think alien life will have evolved in the same way as that on earth and will be based on DNA? Very interesting question. I, I'm pretty confident that it will have evolved by something like Darwinian means, but 
DNA, probably not. I mean, I think the DNA is, is only one method in which this can happen. It, it, it would have to be something equivalent to DNA. I think we have to be some sort of self-replicating molecule. I suspect that the genetic code will have to be digital. Um, it might not necessarily be one dimensional as DNA is. It could be a two dimensional matrix, for example. Um, but the answer to the question is yes to Darwinian evolution, no to DNA, or if yes to DNA, then certainly no to the same DNA code. Would, would that be much too much of a coincidence for it to be the same code? Possibly not too much of a coincidence for it to be a DNA, but unlikely, I think, um, but probably digital. And uh, another question, do you believe after looking at the history of human existence that we seem to want to be controlled it's very interesting or feel morally we need to be controlled by something such as religion i hope not um i i don't i've never thought of it like that before um i mean a kind of submissive desire to be to be dominated um maybe some people have that i i don't think I do. I don't think I want to be dominator. I don't want to dominate either for that matter, but but um, no, I don't, I don't think so really. So, so why then somebody else asks, have humans evolved to have consciousness um, as this quality of humans doesn't seem to have any root in sub goals or even in the main goal of reproduction as you've touched upon, but why, why have we? Well, um, it, it's not obvious to me that it's not, I mean, I think it probably is useful. It's not, I, I, it has been suggested that consciousness is an epiphenomenon, that, it, that it's something that just happens and it's nothing to do with the need to survive. But I think that there must be something about it which is good for survival, something about a conscious brain which enables it to do things better than if it was unconscious. That isn't obviously true. I mean, it, it would be perfectly in, in principle possible for us to be, for living creatures to be robots without any consciousness at all. Uh, like chess playing computers. I mean, chess playing computers are very, very good at chess, but I think nobody thinks they're conscious. Um, and so it would be possible to build a robot which did everything that humans do uh, and yet was unconscious. Um, and so that's a telling argument against the idea that consciousness is useful, but I still feel there must be something more that makes it useful. And I, obviously I don't understand what that is. Um this is another important we haven't brought up this, but are the propagation of memes similar to the propagation of genes? Are they the equivalent of the biological meaning of life? Well, I mean, the, the, the reason for su suggesting the concept of memes in the first place was to explore the possibility that they are equivalent, uh, because um, if, if they're not, then, we, then the concept is of no value. Um, but but I, I suggested it because I was interested in the idea that genes might not be the only self-replicating entity which was subject to Darwinian selection. Um, it's quite clear that memes exist in the sense that there, that there is self-replication um, in, uh, in human culture. But whether you can actually make a useful Darwinian theory out of them as replicators is a matter for further research. I think there's, it's promising, but, it, but it's not certain. Um, somebody asks, to what extent are you pessimistic? They don't suggest that you could be optimistic, but there we go, about the potential impacts on human existence of AI um, and, and the encroachment of silicon-based intelligence in the future. I am interested in this. Um, it, 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 there's a fascinating book by Max Tegmark, a physicist, about um, super AI and, and how he thinks it will be a, it'll be a complete takeover of everything that we do. And, He's optimistic in the sense that he thinks, although there will be a takeover, it means we can, in, we can, we, we humans, we soft, pudgy things can can get on with enjoying life and leave all the work and all the thinking to, to artificial intelligence. Um, a lot of people are pessimistic about that. They they think that would destroy uh, human enterprise and and would make our lives meaningless. Um, I I I don't really have a view about that. I mean, I, I, I'm both excited by it and, and, and fear it at the same time. So, but I, I'd quite like to come back in a couple of hundred years time and, 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 and see what, what progress has been made. We'll sneak in um, 
Michael's question, which is about the peer pressure he, he feels um, that drives the tribalism which perpetuates religious do dogma and how humanity, in your view, overcomes that. I think tribalism is a great menace and, and uh, it's one of the, um, one of the sub goals, I suppose I could, I could say, which has is, which is, um, sub subverted the main goal. Um, there, there, there probably is a biological advantage in uh, tribal loyalty um, and it's clearly gone too far. And so you have um, tribal loyalty leading to highly dis destructive ends. Um, so, um, and, and religious tribalism is, is only one form. There are other forms as well, political tribalism and so on. I mean, the, the great wars of history have been, have been fermented by uh, tribal loyalties, my country, right or wrong, um, etc. A lot of those wars are fought not on religious basis, though, as, as you point out in the book, there's, there's nationalism and a great deal of other things that fuel those. Indeed. Yeah. Yes, and the, well, the First World War is, 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 is an, an example of a, of, a, of a tribal war. The, tri the tribes are huge. I mean, the great nation, the, the, tri the, the, the tribal instinct has got generalized to in, to entire nations with and with with modern um, weapons that with terrible, disastrous, catastrophic results. I'm sorry to end on a on a not so positive note, but um, but it is now it's time to to sadly sort of draw it to a close. But I'd like to thank all of you for for coming very very much indeed. Thanks for all your questions. I hope I got through as, as many of them as possible and the most important one about the shirt. Um, and Richard, thank you again. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much.